dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. We all know the value of diplomacy. We all know the value of consideration and tolerance. There's also a value in the ability to speak clearly what's on our mind in a persuasive fashion. St. Peter demonstrates this the day of Pentecost, and I want to look at that with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Peter, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we came together to get today in order to, to become better leaders, in order to hear the, cry, the call of Christ in our lives to be better leaders, and in order to really see what God has in store for us as leaders. And, you know, as Christians, a lot of us are so timid about the fact that we're called to be leaders that we lead poorly. You cannot be a leader unless you accept with confidence that call to leadership. And I want us to think about that. How many of us are shaken at various points in our lives, it, it kind of like have lost heart, so to speak, right? you, because of the criticisms, the, the lack of comprehension, the mistakes that we've made, the, you know, you know uh, I think Christianity doesn't help us a lot at that particular point because we are constantly reminded of where we fell. And what we're supposed to do is constantly confess that we've fallen. And this is, of course, a very good thing. It could be turned into a dynamic point in our leadership if we understand it correctly. But a lot of us don't start by understanding it correctly. We start by saying, and therefore, I'm just giving myself an excuse to not try again. Almost like by proclaiming my faults or my failings, I'm also proclaiming my inability to lead and my lack of right to take the mantle of leadership upon my shoulders because I've demonstrated time and again that I'm not worthy, that I'm not good enough. Think about how you feel, a lot of you, with your families. You know, we, we all live with this kind of regret. We, we're out there in the workforce killing it, and behind us, we're like, yeah, but our kids, etc. right? And so then we, we just carry that around with us. And so when the time comes for us to act boldly, and to take that eight-year-old out for her birthday or to encourage giving a purity ring to our 15-year-old, right? We, we, end up, we end up backing down. Why? Because, well, I haven't been there. I'm not there. I'm not good enough. And that self, that's because of self-fulfilling prophecy of defeat. And, and, and it's you're like, well, that's because I've learned to be humble. You know, my humility tells me that I'm not a leader. I mean, let's be honest, if everybody thought that, nobody would lead. How many leaders out there are, are, are without stain, without spot? How many leaders out there are those who never made mistakes or who have never known failure? On the contrary, we know well, the, the, this whole story of leadership is people who, despite their, their brokenness and despite their failures, push through and reach the goal. My question for you is not whether or not you're an imperfect leader, but whether you're a leader, whether you'll accept that anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. 
Our country is bereft of leaders and we Christians who should be the premier people on the front lines of the battle of culture end up dismissing ourselves out of humility. I think if we were really humble, we would recognize that it's, our leadership is not about us to begin with. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ moving in and through us and that he can take even our mistakes and our brokenness and yes, even our failures and transform them into success by his grace and his glory, but he cannot and will not do it without us. Are we willing to say that because we have made mistakes, we will not be able to lead. Therefore, some other mistaken person who lacks humility will take up that mantle of leadership and lead us all poorly. Are we willing to say, I'm not willing to say that, and I hope you're not either. Because somebody's going to be leading us, and nobody in this world is perfect. So why say that those who know that they're not perfect, therefore, are the first to disqualify themselves from leadership? <laughs> no. It's on the contrary, those are the safest leaders. Because knowing that they're not perfect, knowing their imperfection, they will be able to limit their mistakes through their humility. But they have to get up and try again. You cannot say that because I've made mistakes, I must therefore not make any more. And so the safest thing to do is eliminate me from the role of leadership. I can't keep talking to my wife after I've apologized, after she's apologized, and then I did it again, you know. Therefore, like I'm just a bad person. You can't allow yourself to do that. Because the moment that you stop leading, someone else does. And you have been called by Christ to not allow someone else to be in the heart of your wife, telling her the negativity and leading her poorly. Someone else to be in the heart of your husband, telling him the negativity and leading him poorly. Someone else to be in the heart of your children, leading them poorly. Our, 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 we cannot allow this. Well, what, what's necessary is that our humility actually become our safeguard. A humble leader is a great leader, but a humble leader still has to lead. Humility is no excuse. On the contrary, it actually encourages and pushes us forth to show our greatness. You see, it's like we think that if you're humble, you can't be great. But it's just the opposite. You can't be great unless you're humble. Because the greatness that you think, I mean, think about it. It's a contradiction, I know. But the greatness that you have inside of you will only be given to the degree that you put it at the service of others. Which means that if I don't have that humility that allows me to serve freely, and if I don't have that humility that, that unlocks the, the, the potential that I have and places it effectively at the service of others, I will not let my greatness show. And at the same time, the greatness that I have will twist into egotism. My talents will become all about me. And instead of becoming a loving torch that's shedding a beautiful light on this earth, I become a monster because I just want you to recognize my greatness. We realize that both of those re are, have the same root. Greatness needs humility. It feeds upon humility, but humility does not and must not become an excuse to not being great. We need great leaders who indeed are humble like St. Peter. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E -E -E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. You know, I want to take us together to, to look at how this is all played out. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 where St. Peter makes his first speech. Now, this is amazing because if you remember the life of St. Peter, he was someone who's always, of course, like a leader, a man of solidity. Jesus knew Peter before Peter was called. Why? Because he lived in the same town as Peter. And Peter was a successful fisherman who had inherited that business from his father, was in partnership with James and John, 
and was a person of establishment. He was always recognized as the leader of the apostles. They gave him respect. He was the one that spoke in their voice and stood up at various moments. And yet Peter also had a dark side. The dark side meaning, of course, a weakness. Peter wasn't perfect. Either are you. But what Peter did, unlike many of you, is that Peter didn't stop leading just because he saw he wasn't perfect. And neither, and I think it's such a neat thing because just as we don't want to have that happen to us, so too let's look around ourselves and ask, who is it that I am knocking out of the gift that they have of their greatness just because I'm in presence of their imperfection? Right? Like, so when someone else demonstrates, I don't know, a type of incompetency, a type of, do I therefore say, you do not have the right to give your gifts? Am I as judgmental, as harsh upon those around me as I am upon myself? Odds are you are. And what's neat is if you allow yourself to say, hey, I am imperfect and yet I will keep going and I will allow my humility and my sense of my imperfection to actually hone and enhance my service of leadership, well, then I can actually do the same and I will do the same to other people around me. How wonderful is our God? How great is his mercy and his power in our lives? And so even though he failed the Lord by denying him three times, and that's, of course, his famous downfall, he was reinstituted by the Lord by three proclamations of love in John 21. But if you think about it, this is something like 50 days after our Lord rose from the dead, you have Acts chapter 2 happen. 50 days. A month and two weeks plus 10 days. So you've actually got almost two months. So we'll give it two months if you want to be a little bit generous. After our Lord died and after he had betrayed him by denying him three times and had fled in the garden, Peter's great failure, you have this scene where Peter delivers an absolutely majestic speech replete with biblical references. I, I want to underline this first because a lot of times when we think about the apostles, we kind of like don't really realize just how religious they were. And especially with St. Peter, for some reason or other, we just don't really think that St. Peter is like a really religious man. But when you look at it from a biblical perspective, this fisherman was all the way down in South Israel, next to the Jordan River, where John was baptizing by the Jordan. And, and there in that spot, he'd gone all the way there to hear John the Baptist. And it was there, hearing John the Baptist, that he met Christ. But he had gone to hear John the Baptist. He had traveled three days on foot in order to hear John. So he must have also had a certain amount of stability in his business, or else he never could have left for that long. You think about it. He was gone for probably 10 days. There's a lot of fish that could be done. Well, he must have been okay. Maybe he had his, his workers working in there for him so he could take this pilgrimage and put God first. Maybe Simon Peter was trying to develop his own leadership over his men. I don't know, but he went down to hear the greatest preacher of all time, John the Baptist, preach. And it was there that he met Christ. Then he went back up again. And so when Christ called him, he was calling a person who was looking for the Messiah and who was devout. Then he spent three years in that religious context following Jesus on foot. He heard him preach. He heard the debates with the Pharisees. He asked him questions. And, and then he was surrounded by, gosh, 11 other guys, all of whom were super devout. I mean, a devout enough to leave, as Peter himself says, wife and children and lands for the sake of Christ. This was no religious lightweight. But we never get to see him actually teaching or preaching until now. And he delivers a speech to just, that just bowls us over. If you look at Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's a powerful moment. 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit is given to the apostles. And they begin to speak. And that speech in tongues, we wonder what that means. What it means, when you hear tongues, think of languages. And the idea is that they were speaking in their language, but the Holy Spirit was speaking at the same moment, translating what they were saying into the languages of every single person who was there. And it lists them all off. You know, it's amazing. Parthians, Medes, Elimantes, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. And it keeps on going. Of all these different languages that were there, and they would just be speaking, say, in English, which they weren't, but they're speaking in English, and then the Germans and the French and the Italians were all hearing them speak in their language. That's an amazing thought. What were they saying? Verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Isn't that amazing? What, a, what words of a leader. He stands up, lifts up his voice, addresses the crowd and says, listen carefully to what I have to say. Let me explain this to you. The sympathy, this, wow, Simon Peter is getting the sympathy of the crowd, commanding their attention because he's going to say something. And then he goes on. And what does he say? Well, he goes in this amazing speech. He begins by talking about uh, how these are the last days when the Holy Spirit has been given so that you might know and call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 21. So the Holy Spirit has been given. These are days of the prophecy. And he quotes uh, the, the prophet Joel. Then he goes on and he says that David, King David, verse 25, spoke about Jesus. And he quotes King David about Jesus. So he must have obviously had this like inspired, this must have been memorized text. St. Peter was a man imbued with the Bible and it was coming out of his very pores. And then verse 29, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, but his tomb is here to this day. But he is a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. Now that's amazing. Because there, that's verse 31, you have the very first time that you have an overt reference to the resurrection. Now, Remember, people can understand that the Messiah was come. People were willing to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They just weren't ready to believe that the Messiah would die. And they certainly weren't ready to believe that the Messiah who died would rise again. And yet that's what Jesus taught them that the Messiah would do. Peter stands up and boldly makes that his proclamation. His proclamation finishes with him saying, verses, verse 40, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Why? Verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a bold proclamation and it demonstrates Peter's leadership. His confidence, he stands up, raises his voice, calms, calls attention. When it comes time for him to speak about Jesus, he does it by bearing witness with himself. I tell you confidently, he says, right? And then what are they supposed to do? He calls them to action. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This is confidence. This is boldness. This is leadership offered and given from humility. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. All right, so when we see this Peter unleashing here in Acts 2, what is it teaching us? Well, I mean, it teaches us a lot. But the thing that I think that 
it, it re, and when I hear it, I get excited because I'm hearing a leader of the church proclaiming truth with boldness. In, in our day and age, when was the last time you heard that or, or experienced that? Have you ever experienced that? A man standing up and by, well, vouching with it with himself and his own character, putting himself behind his very words, proclaiming Jesus Christ's truth to this world. Well, that's already exciting. And that's exactly what church leaders need to be doing, without a doubt. But let me turn the tables a little bit on you and say, well, what about you? Where is boldness in your life? I mean, the church leaders are, are supposed to lead the church. What about leading your cities? What about leading your 4-H clubs? <laughs> you know? What about leading the teenagers when they're hanging out at your house? You know, sometimes you hear these terrible stories, you know, families that are like, well, listen, we'll give them, we'll let them drink at our house because at least that way we know that they're at our house. You know, we're just going to be like, what kind of leadership is that? Or leadership that says, you know, we're going to tell you guys that you, you know, absolutely need to get married uh, in order to, you know, start a family. But then when you actually come and say you want to cohabitate, well, we just say that's fine because you love each other. I mean, again, what kind of, how can the churchmen lead if we proclaim the truth and then in the family you contradict it? And why do you, you don't really believe that your kids should live together. You don't believe that. But then I mean, how would people really think that? Like, that's just like, that's not the ideal. Then if it's not the ideal, where are you leading them towards? I can do all that I can to proclaim the truth about marriage. But if marriages themselves don't bear witness to that truth, you know, am I, what, what are we going to end up with? And it's the same anywhere you go. So what ends up happening is that the priests say, well, the people don't really care. The families aren't backing us up anyway. So we'll end up just doing the same thing. And we aren't leading anybody anywhere. That's just one issue. There's a million others like self-esteem in your daughters. Where does self-esteem in daughters come from? Well, a lot of studies are saying that dads have a vital role to play. It's not essential, but it's definitely vital. And if they don't have a dad in their life loving them and affirming them and working with them and making them great, it will be a lot harder. Well, okay. If you believe those studies, then what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to have to face the fact that I too have to become bold in my leadership. We're afraid to be bold because we don't want to be impolite. We don't want to impose. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. We shouldn't be impolite and we shouldn't impose. Well, at least after they reach a certain age. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with imposing when they're young. That's called parenting. But obviously, we have this instinct inside of us where we say to ourselves, you know what, like, I just don't want to be one of those guys. It's over the top, one of those guys. So what ends up happening is that we are all like these amazing people with amazing moral sense and great talent and skill inside of ourselves. And yet we end up doing and living at the lowest common denominator of our society. Because strangely enough, folks who usually are not as well-educated or sophisticated in, in who they are, they end up being very forthright about what they want and what they need. <laughs> and since they're forthright about what they want and they need, and the rest of the great people don't want to like act like they're great, or be one of those guys that's over the top, we end up letting the common, lowest common denominator of our society dictate what, how we act together. And the same thing happens in the family. Because we don't want to impose things, we'll just turn on the TV. Because if the TV's on, well, that's kind of what everybody else is saying is good. And so, you know, and then you're like, well, who controls the TV? It's not everybody else who controls the TV, folks. <laughs> The TV is controlled by businesses, okay? And they have a monopoly on the market because nobody else can compete with their price to get their, their, the capital to start their own television network. You just don't do that unless you're Mother Angelica, in which case you're just a force of nature. But beyond that, like you just don't do that. So what do you do? You just end up swallowing as if everyone approved and then you let your family live at the level of everybody else. 
when it's your family and not everybody else's. And let me tell you what, when bad things happen then in your family, nobody's going to come and sympathize with you and be like, well, you're right. That is what everybody else did. No. And I'm telling you what else? God is not going to sympathize with you. (laughs) He's not going to come in and be like, bro, great job. You did what everybody else did. And so therefore you're okay. And, And that's just the honest goodness, truth of possibility in your life. You have an awesome possibility. You can take the reins on your family. You can take the reins on your marriage. You can take the reins on this world and you can lead it. And it all begins with you accepting deep down in your heart that your greatness begins where your humility begins. Let your humility, instead of smashing you down, be like Simon Peter. Simon Peter recognized in his humility that he had failed and therefore he stood with the 11, little note, because he was with his brothers humbly. And he spoke a word of truth that he knew this world needed because while he failed once, he would not fail again. And he would demonstrate by his actions and by this proclamation and by his steadfast dedication to the truth, he would be able to to, to manifest his repentance and his true humility. If you're really repentant and really sorry and really humbled by your life and your past, Well, then dare great things with what you've got now. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.